And then uh, this one, yes, I can be heard, yay. <laughs> Hello everyone. I'm here to tell you that I was a lie, so we took a break anyway. <laughs> um, next up we have um, uh, the team lead of the Umbraco CMS uh, project, uh, Bjarke Berg, who is going to be talking us, to us about V10, maybe V11, maybe, we'll see. Give a big hand of applause for Bjarke. <clears throat> Thank you. And welcome back, everyone. Let's just get the slides up. All right, let's just jump into it. As Philip mentioned, Umbrago 10 will be ready, or is ready. It will be shipped tomorrow on Nougat. And we had five release candidates, and I have to thank you. There was a lot of community involvement, and the final product was way better than the first release candidate, so thank you. Also, thank you to all the package offers that already prepared their packages for version 10. Umbrago 10 will also be the default on Umbrago Cloud from tomorrow. And this time, it's even simplified, uh, even more simple when you have to upgrade from Umbrago 9. You can keep the same project. We have documented how to do it, uh, both as text and videos. And as Philip mentioned, we will also look into if we can do it automatically for some of the simple projects. As always, when we do minor versions, we have updated our dependencies. The most important thing here is the target framework is now updated to .NET 6, which is a long-term support version. Microsoft managed to find even more performance improvements in some of the very low-level parts of the framework, which Umbrago benefits from. And also, .NET 6 brings C Sharp 10, which I'm sure developers will be happy about. There are some features that makes your life more easy. I especially like the features uh, about file, sca file scope namespaces, where you can avoid indenting your entire file, and global usings, where you avoid a lot of boilerplate in each file. We also updated the underlying web framework. So now we run on ASP.NET Core version 6. Overall, when we, update, oh, when we use the web framework, there's not that many changes in the parts. We use the MVC parts, but all the new features from C Sharp is available. We also updated our dependency to Image Sharp to version 2. So Image Sharp is the library we use for image manipulations, like scaling, cropping, reading image data from different file formats. And the new big feature in, in Image Sharp 2 is native support for WebP, which I know a lot of you have requested due to the recommendations from Google Lighthouse analysis. But be aware, this is a major change, or major version change. So there's also breaking changes here if you use Image Sharp's API directly from your solution. If you just use it through Umbrago, of course, we handle all the breaking changes for you. Also, Examine is updated. So Examine is the abstraction and library we use to do full text search. The new feature in the latest version is mainly updated. It's an updated dependency to lucene.net. So now it runs in the latest version. Also here, it's a major upgrade. So there are some breaking changes if you use the APIs uh, directly. And again, if you use it through Umbrago, of course, we handle those for you. I'm sure Shannon will cover more about Examine in his talk uh, on this stage tomorrow. We also updated NPOGO. So NPOGO is the uh, mini object relationship mapper we use. Uh, it's now running NPOGO 5. NPOGO 5 was actually released already when we released Umbrago 9, but due to a bug, we couldn't update. There were breaking changes and it didn't work. But and Pogo managed to fix those now, so we can upgrade. And in general, we updated all our dependencies. A lot of patch versions is also updated, like the AngularJS mail kit that we use to communicate with mail servers, JS did, as we use to compare content versions in the back office. And as Philip said, we're really happy that we now are cross-platform support. We have the same experience on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS X. So the first thing we had to do 
was to get rid of uh, SQL Compact Edition. SQL Compact Edition uh, had been end of life for almost one year, and it was a Windows-only embedded database, and it actually limited us from uh, benefit from .NET 6 in all of our assemblies, because they had to be net standard. Instead, we introduced SQLite, and SQLite is the world's most popular database. It is blessing fast on reads, but you have to be aware there is one major limitation. This is due to writes. There can only be one writer at a time for the entire database, not just a row or a table. That's the entire database. But it still makes it a perfect fit for development, where you are one developer. And in theory, you could use it in production, as you just need to be aware of the limitations. But small sites with just one editor would work perfectly. We also uh, introduced a new main dumb lock, and main dumb is an internal concept in Umbrago that we use to ensure only one instance are logging files on the disk. In Umbrago 9, we use the named semaphore lock uh, on Windows, but named semaphores are not available on Linux or on uh, app services on, on Asia. So here we used a SQL one. Now we introduced a file, physical file main dump lock that is the same on all platforms and the default. Philip also mentioned we now introduce nullable reference types. And this was introduced in .NET free, Core 3 uh, as an opt-in feature. But since .NET 6, Microsoft has shipped it as enabled in their templates. And we do the same from Umbrago 10. It's a complete new way of thinking. It's completely opposite from what we learned when we were introduced to languages like C Java, or Java, whatever. Because now, all reference types cannot be null. You have to explicit mention this can be null. In general, it's a set of features that helps avoid runtime nullability issues. Uh, it's just a compile time analysis. So the generated assemblies are still the same. But you have to be aware if you want to opt into this in an existing code base. It's a quite big task. We know that. <laughs> um, but if you do new development on Umbrago 10, I will highly, highly recommend to turn this feature on. And it's enabled in the Umbrago code base. And this means you have extra information available when you use the C-sharp APIs, no matter if you opt it in or out of nullable reference types. So one example is if you use the user service to get a user using a, a username you'll now explicit know this is a nullable user because if you use a username that doesn't exist, it will return null. And thereby, you will have a warning uh, if, you, if you didn't check for null. On the other hand, if you use the user service to get all users, you'll have a list of users. And before, in theory, it could also have been null. You didn't know from the signature of the method. But now you know the, the list cannot be null and the items cannot be null. Let's look at some of the breaking changes also. So Philip mentioned this one. At the application starting point, we need to hook in as early as possible. This is part of your code base, so we can't update it automatically. The reason for this is basically to have a hook where we can initialize the static service provider. We have a static service provider that we use to avoid breaking changes in minor versions. And it needs to be initialized as early as possible. We had an issue, actually a null reference exception, <laughs> in 9.4, because we tried to use it too early. It wasn't uh, initialized. So to avoid that kind of issues in the future, we introduced this. Also, we cleaned up the solution you have. We moved a lot of Umbraco files out of your solution. You are not intended to change these anyway. So we have all the razor views that are used to spin up back office, the installer, if you don't have any nodes, and all these uh, views required are now served from a razor class library together with all the static assets that we need for the back office to run. And also we embedded some, uh, some of the files, like the translation files. You, were done, you wasn't intended to change these anyway. 
So yeah, and also the uh, embedded snippets. So now your solution is way cleaner, and you can't by accident change something that you are not intended to do. We also have live update of configurations. This, to do this, it was required to update a lot of constructors to use an I option monitor instead of I option, which is Microsoft things. We don't expect you to use these constructors manually because in theory it should only be used through the service provider, but if you have unit tests or something, it, it is likely that you use the constructors yourself. And finally, we also changed some method signatures to be async. This is a change we want to do more of in the future because it, it benefits performance. Uh, from Brago 10, it's mainly around content finders and the abstractions we use for search. And in general, we will try to be better at announcing breaking changes ahead of time. So we use the obsolete attributes in code if we have an existing alternative that we can point you to. But in cases like the SQL Compact Edition uh, versus SQL Lite, we knew that we, didn't, we just didn't have a good uh, platform to announce it. So we want to introduce a new GitHub repository, which will be heavy inspired by how Microsoft announced breaking changes. So you have all the benefits from uh, GitHub. You can watch it, you can have notifications. But at the same time, and this was actually feedback from the community team, we want to integrate this information into the release pages on our, so we have all the information on one page. So this was the new things in, in 10, but since we released 9.0, we also introduced a lot of features. So let's look at some of those. The first one I want to cover is what we call history cleanup. So every time you publish some content from Umbrago, we save a, a history version. And a lot of people don't even know this, and it just stores up a lot of, uh, of, of storage. Now we introduce the feature where you can automatically uh, clean those up. It's highly configurable, so you can configure it on a global level. You can override on uh, document types, as the upper screenshot shows. And you can even, on a single content item, prevent that from ever being cleaned up. This is a good use case if you have some front page, say Halloween page, and you want to roll back and look how it looked last year. Philip also mentioned the uh, item relations. So now we use the relation info we have way better. And yeah, thanks Dave for all your contribution for this feature. So when you try to delete an item that is referenced somewhere, you will have a list of files or list of items that reference it. So you can manually clean it up, and you can, all, you can still delete it if you want, but there's a, a big warning, and it's configurable whether you are, will allow your editors to actually delete it or not. Uh, to do this, we had to uh, add a new property on our, uh, our relation types. It's called is a dependency, uh, because we also have a lot of information that is just nice to know, but shouldn't stop you from deleting or unpublishing like when you copy a content node, there's a relation, but it shouldn't stop you from deleting it. We also introduced two-factor authentication. We really simplified what it requires for you to set up, both for users and members. So for users, we control most of the UI, but you still have to specify how it looks when you set up the uh, two-factor authentication because it, it depends on how you do it and what technology you use. We have documented how to, how to do with an Authenticator app that at least works with Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator, and LastPass Authenticator. And I know Sebastian, who presented me uh, in one of the Umbra Collab sessions on YouTube, actually tried to do it using his YubiKey and managed to do it. It's super cool. But we also have, have notifications if you want to use email to yeah, send a password, one-time password, or phone messages, or whatever. Uh, for members, you control even more of the, uh, of the UI. So here we updated the snippets and, of course, the documentation. We also introduced external login for members. This was a highly requested feature. Uh, <clears throat> so now the snippets is updated, and the documentation is clear how it requires to set up, say, 
Facebook or Twitter and everything. And especially for members, the feature we call Autolink is incredibly uh, important because using this feature, you can allow users to log in using their Twitter, Google, whatever, without they have an existing member. And in that case, we just create a member and Autolink it. And also, if they have a member uh, but use the same email for the external, uh, external login, we will uh, auto-link those. We also introduced some UI to change the level of detail when we send telemetry. So now you are allowed to opt out or even opt into sending more detail. If you use the minimal level, we only send a random ID that is just unique for your solution, but we don't know anything about your solution. It is just to have the same ID on all your environments. So we know this is a development environment. Well, we don't know that, but it, it, it doesn't count as two. If you use the basic, which is the default, we, have, we send the ID, we send the version of Umbrago, and we send uh, a list of the package names you have installed. If you opt into the detailed, which I hope many will do because the information is valuable to uh, Umbrago HQ, we send some numbers like the number of content nodes, the number of media, the number of duct types, and the feature. The most important thing, in my opinion, is we also send what property editors are you using, because this is super valuable for us when we introduce new property editors to see if there's an uptake. Or, yeah, one case is the block list, which covers the same use cases as the nested content. We want to see if people are migrating away from the nested content. Or, as Philip mentioned, the new grid. How many is actually using the grid? We have no idea today. Let's look at some of the insights, but it's still a fairly new feature, so we don't have that many insights, and there's a couple of limitations. So, the data contains yeah, data from both production, staging, testing, and development sites, and the telemetry was first introduced in 9.10. Oh, sorry, 8.10. And the first thing is package users, which was introduced even later in 8.18 and 9.2. Here I have some data where I look at sites that have reported once, at least once, and at least five times. And sites report when they're rebooted. Uh, from 9 on, we, re we also uh, send data once a day. But here we look at how many sites are actually running without packages at all. And this was a surprise to me. Uh, but again, the more times the site has reported, the, m the more likely it is it uses packages, which is also, it makes sense because all, all new sites start without packages. Um, also, if we look at how many is only using HQ packages, that was also quite a big number to me. But again, if you start a new project on Umbrago Cloud, this is, this is what you have only. And the final one, which is not a surprise. More than half of all projects are using community packages, and we can't highlight enough how important the community packages are for the environment. If we look at some of the most used packages, we have the Umbrago HQ forms deploy ID, and as no surprise, we have using and contentment, two really popular packages out there. We have a lot of map packages, so we have a Google Maps package from Umbrago 8, we have Models Builder, we have an open street map it's from Brago 8. We have the starter kit. We have an open street map package from Brago 9. The duct type grid editor. We have the diplo god mode. And then a package that is named real time. I'm sorry, I don't know <laughs> what it is. But if you know it, come visit me in the corner later. And the icon picker. I'll also briefly touch on the release schedule that, as Philip did. So we have major versions twice a year around June and around December. The important one is December, because we want to ship as early as possible after the new .NET version is shipped in November, and then just half a year before. And having two major versions a year really reduced the number of changes. And this was the graphic that Philip told you about. If we look at the number of commits, you can see it's almost 10 times smaller than regular major versions. The number of files changed is still quite high in this, but this is due to the nullable reference types where we had to touch almost all the C, C sharp uh, APIs. But also, if we look at insertion and deletions, it's around 10 times smaller. 
And this is also the feedback we had some, so far. It is maybe 10 times easier to upgrade to this Meta version compared to earlier. We have the minor releases every six weeks. And from Dragon 9 and forward, you know that you don't have API breaking changes. Uh, so there's no reason to stay on an old version when you upgrade. Just update to the latest uh, minor and the latest patch version. It makes sense. Then we, because that many, that many major versions, we can't support all of them in a long uh, term. We also align with Microsoft on long-term support versions. So every time an Umbrago version runs natively on a long-term supported version of .NET, like Umbrago 10 runs on .NET 6 long-term support, it will be long-term support. And to show this on a, on a diagram, we can see that Umbrago 7 is end of life in around one year. Uh, Umbrago 8, which was a long-term support, uh, have around one and a half year of bug fixes and then one year of security fixes. But Umbrago 9 will soon be end of life. So if you are running Umbrago 9, we highly recommend updating to Umbrago 10. Umbrago 10 will, from tomorrow, have two years of bug fixes and one year additional of security fixes. And the next long-term supported version will be Umbrago 13, which will be by the end of next year, and it will be end of life three years after the release. So let's cover the roadmap. Philip did some of it, but I will try to dive into some of the things also. We have the permissions for variants. So this is where we want to limit who can save and publish variants uh, of given languages. So the way we want to do this is on user groups, we want to add a new field for what languages are you allowed to manipulate. And if you don't add any, you have access to all uh, languages. So if you don't do anything, it would be like it is today. And then um, we want to introduce a new configuration to make this possible in Umbrago 10 already in one minor version, because otherwise it will be a breaking change. But today, you can only save the invariant properties or publish those when you publish the default language. But using this feature, you could have a situation where you're not allowed to publish the default. So we want to make a configuration where you can turn on so you are allowed to publish those on every language. And we will update the UI so you are aware, or the editors are aware, when they change something that is shared between a lot of languages. Philip also mentioned the new uh, block-based grid. I won't go into details about this, but please read the RFC. Come with your input. Also, we want to investigate uh, the entity framework. So entity framework is best practice on .NET. And we have a lot of user requests, but we need to investigate. We need to do some proof of concept because we have some highly complex uh, SQL queries today, if we can have these perform well in the future. We also hope that Entity Framework Core can replace our own migrations, so we can just use those instead. Yes, Philip also mentioned the headless REST API and webhooks in Umbrago Core. Uh, but it's not me who will go into details. It is Morten later on this stage. Um, to watch his talk if you are interested in what it means for the CMS. We want to introduce lazy loaded content. So today, all published content is in memory all time. And this is a bit memory cons consuming if you have a very big site. So we want to make it configurable uh, using a least recently used uh, cache algorithm. And if you just use or configure it with a high number, you will have the same experience as today. But if you use a smaller number, you have a smaller memory consumption. Philip also mentioned uh, content reuse. And it is something we know a lot of you have solved out there, but we need a common way, a native way to do it. And we, again, the stakeholder group helped us point at competitors that do this well. So we want to investigate and find a solution that is at least as good as those. Then we have the block level variations. Yeah, so today, if you have a variant block list or grid, you will have to 
repeat everything on each language. And this is what we want to avoid. Uh, so hopefully in the future, or the idea is in the future, you can have an invariant structure, share the same structure, but only update some of the blocks, or only vary uh, culture-wise in some of the blocks. Philip mentioned the new back office. This is the biggest project for us right now. Uh, he mainly covered the front end parts, but this also means something for the back end. So we want to introduce a new web API with more but smaller APIs, so it's more, uh, more reusable. And hopefully we can also clean up a bit in the code base and not have that much, that much business logic in the, uh, in the web components. To summarize, Umbrago 11, and if possible, we will ship these features uh, in minor versions of Umbrago 10. The permissions for variants and the block-based grid. Umbrago 12, which will be uh, one year from now, hopefully, <laughs> we can have Entity Framework Core introduced as a replacement for Npogo, and we will introduce the Headless REST API. And for Umbrago 13, which will be the end of next year. New back office. Again, I have to highlight, we are aiming for this date. Uh, the content reuse, the block level variations, the lazy loaded content, and webhooks. That was my update. Thank you for listening. And remember, <laughs> visit us in the uh, CMS corner. Thank you so much, Bjarke, for being here. Um, I'm definitely going to choose uh, Umbraco 13 uh, from tomorrow, right? Because it's having all the things. Okay. Um, thank you. <laughs>